is Walter. Hey, I'm Brent. And welcome to another episode of Soundtrack. And uh, we're going to start right off with uh, our recent listens. So uh, recently I've been listening to a lot more like hip hop and like J-pop oriented stuff lately. Uh, I recently really got into like Ghost Mane uh, pretty heavily. And um, I didn't realize that I would actually like his uh, style. It's kind of like um, if uh, hip hop went industrial. Yeah, you mentioned he was really Marilyn Manson inspired. The the little I knew of him, he he almost seemed like I think I described him as like black metal fused with like trap or something. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. And then um, l- listening to this guy named Young Yogi. So if you're familiar with Volumes, the band from like early 2000s, 11s, early 2010s, they have a hit called um, uh, Wormholes. One of the members goes by Young Yogi. And uh, I recently got his got into his album, A Rush of Dope to the Head, <laughs> uh, not too long ago, actually. And it wasn't too bad. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. There's this one banger that I generally really liked. It's called um, Pax on a Boat. And I thought like that was just Bass Central. And I was like, oh, man. Bass City. Ba- it is Bass City. Like this, Your car literally just vibrates of just intensity of how massive this bass is and i think i played it in the car earlier today it's just did, like yeah Burr. as far as like j-pop i'm gonna butcher this name like there's no tomorrow's like jesu no kiwa me tome tome yeah that's terrible and then uh oh j cole on as far as like oh, the hip-hop okay. spectrum i've been listening to his uh, album kod and uh, that's a really good album i really enjoyed it KOD stands for kids on drugs. If or uh FYI. Yeah, a little FYI. Which is really cool. I really like the ar- album artwork and like um kind of his take on like how people fall in love just based on a photograph, which is a song called Photograph. Like you you haven't even met the person or but you've already like established this connection with this person you haven't even met and kind of like falling in love. It's crazy. I I've heard the term parasocial relationship going around more recently in this like world of social media of just like or or just like content creators of like fans mm-hmm. building this relationship with someone but it's completely one-sided yeah yeah which is to me it's crazy like you can trick yourself into like falling in love with this person and you haven't even met them at all and then uh i took a little deep dive back into like late 90s yeah with uh big his album uh ready to die and uh, after watching his documentary, I got something, I got a story to tell. I kind of reminded myself that I really enjoyed this album, like, growing up. And, uh, of course, you know, Big Papa's on it. And then Juicy is a really uh, really popular one. And Give Me the Loot. I really like this album. And I think kind of solidified my take on, like, me liking East Coast versus West Coast rap. You prefer East Coast? I th- I think so. It just I think it just sounds darker, like, in general. And uh, of course, like different rap styles. I'm not. I'm no hip hop expert putting it out there, but I just know what I like. Of course, like just like the whole feud, like Biggie Tupac feud, like West Coast versus East Coast. And I think I just generally like East Coast rap more. And then of course, you know, I, I like Kendrick Lamar, but he's also West Coast. And like yeah. Tyler the Creator, he's also West Coast. I really enjoy his style too. What about you, Brent? For recent listens, it's as far as recent listens, yeah. For no apparent reason. Just going through shuffle, um, Mr. Bungle's California album oh, came okay. up one day, and I was like, "Oh yeah, this is pretty fun." It, um, I think, a, like a year or two ago, it had some sort of anniversary. I don't remember if it was like twenty years or what it was. It was some big milestone, but yeah, it's it's a fun album that treads the line of weird experimentalism and throwing stuff at the wall, and yet also being strangely catchy. Um, so I was listening to that for a bit. Mostly what I got into, I I didn't listen to a whole lot of new stuff since last time, but probably the biggest one was just getting falling back in love with Animals as Leaders. Oh, and yeah. And specifically the Madness of Many album. As often is the case with me, there's a lot of albums that I'm like a late bloomer to that I like don't fully appreciate till later. And Madness of Many, I liked it when it came out. Joy of Motion's always been my favorite. I, I liked Madness of Many when it came out. But for whatever reason, recently it finally just clicked. And I was mm. like, just start to finish, this album is just a banger, catchy, technical, jazzy. It's it's just really fun to listen to. 
It's like a little brain exercise or like a brain massage. Would you say it's a brain dance? I would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that album is it's just super complex. I mean, like Joy of Motion, I think is a lot of people's favorite albums. It's one of my favorite albums. Once Madness of Many came came into play, like kind of like the same story. I was like kind of a late, not too late of a bloomer, but like I studied it versus enjoyed it a lot i get and yeah like, it's it's not as straightforward so to speak as mm-hmm. george jor of motion has like these way more blatant like this is the melodic catchy part this is the crushing heavy part mm-hmm. and like madison many just sort of like kind of dances around and uh the cool thing about that album is that i think he uses a lot more like electronical dance uh influences on that album like cognitive contortions like that intro is just like it has a really cool synth. I know part what you mean. Beginning. Yeah, it's almost like a sort of like classic sci-fi. Yeah, like synthy noise. And then of course they d- proceed to play in like their thumping technique, which I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. I just like, uh, it's like I, I know it's been in other albums. I just really love that. It's just so pleasing to listen to. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's like so f- quickly rhythmic. It's just it's really satisfying. Like uh, I think we were at the clinic one day. T- oh, one day, one day. T- um, and he was like explaining that, that those are quintuplets. So, which is like a quarter note equaling to five individual subdivisions, five indi- individual subdivisions equaling to like one quarter note, or something like that. Yeah. So it's kind of like that's awesome. Yeah. So like uh, I I just love the way he was explaining how he used like a double stroke with his like thumb and then like um three the rest of the three strokes with his like index middle and like um ring finger to like complete that subdivision I thought it was really cool and like uh yeah anyways well, what else were you like listening to <laughs> it's awesome I'm interested in it but my brain's just like shit I don't understand it, I just like it when it goes dum 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 yeah dum 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 that's the extent of my understanding. It's really cool. It, I can't really count quintuplets personally. Triplets, no problem. But like quintuplets, I, I don't even know how to begin counting them. I can count four, four, and that's it. <laughs> One, two, three, four. There you go. And then the other, the only other li- listen I have is the latest Monument song or single that came out, Dead Nest. Oh. That was really heavy. It was. That was good stuff. It was. I, I was glad to hear it. Like, Animus was good, but, like, when Stead Nest came out, it completely just blew. It's just a strong song, start to finish. And, like, uh, Ollie Steele, I think, is, like, the main writer of that song. If not, he wrote the whole song, but I'm assuming he's, like, a main writer. That song is just crushing. And the vocals are great, too. Absolutely. I think Andy's his name, right? I think so. Yeah, he fits really well, like... With the he's, new Monument song. He's currently. the same one that came from Ever Forthright, I think. That's Chris Beretta. Oh, yikes. It's, it's a new one? It's a new one. Okay. I love Chris Beretta. I'm not going to lie. I think I thought his voice worked really well for mine, but I don't know what goes on personally, like that he just kind of like band hops or like um, oh yeah, some like internal like, stuff. Like a Johnny have. Craig or something. Yeah. I, I don't know what goes on, but like I always know that whenever he's in a band that it I usually internalize that it's gonna be good. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. He had uh yeah, there was some other project he was a part of called like Friend for a Foe or yeah, something Friend like for that. Friend for a Foe, yeah. Ever Forthright, Monuments. And then uh yeah. I think you think he tried out for periphery. If not, there's like some like YouTube clips with like Chris Beretta on vocals. He did a guest I'm pretty sure he did a guest like saxophone solo on a Tesseract song. Oh really? Oh and um one of the songs towards the end of Altered State. That that one. Calibi. Calibi Yowl or whatever. Yeah, it's an Cal- instrumental song. And Sick. there's a sax solo in it. And I'm pretty sure it's him. Sick. Well, we're go- <laughs> well, regardless, the I if it's a new guy then with monuments, then he sounds good. Mm-hmm. Um I dug him the it uh it sounded really epic. It was like, I don't know if he was harmonizing with himself, mm-hmm. like his background vocals, if there's someone else, but it just, uh, it sounded very grand. Yes. Yes. I agree with that. And like, I don't know, his his actual singing voice too is, I, I don't want to say perfect because it, it's very um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Subjective. 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 But it fits really well, and I think his sense of melody is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I feel like that's that's good enough, even if you're not like technically like up to par at a perfect level, if you just vibe enough with the sound of the band you're in. Mm-hmm. Like uh, Monuments is rarely known for, like not rarely, is really known for their um, down picking, like especially John Brown. Like he's a down picking monster. It's, it's insane. I don't think James Hetfield has anything on, on top of his down picking. DMX? Yeah, DMX. So we just lost DMX in like um, the world. Yeah. Like, which sucks. Like, I was never really a huge DMX fan personally, but like, when X is going to give it to you, X is going to give it to you. Yeah. Yeah. I was about to say, that's the only thing I was really familiar with that and just memes of that. Oh, true, true. I know he had like a really huge history of like, you know, drug issues and mental issues. And he was pretty like vocal about it too, as far as like, um, in his songwriting and like um, him being able to publicly speak about it too, like saying he needs help. I think that was super strong of him. Like, absolutely. Yeah. That's super, great to put that out there. Yeah. And like, he knows it and like, he needs other people to like realize and like kind of help him along the way. And it sucks. Cause like, um, I know he left behind a daughter. Ooh. Yeah. I don't know how old she is, but like, um, I'm assuming she's in her teens. I'm going to look this up right now. Yeah, I never, I, I never really listened to him as well. But I mean, anytime there's like a death of a musician, I always feel bad because I just know that feeling of respecting some sort of artist or just having them be like an integral part of your life and that sort of loss. Apparently, she's 15 years old. Apparently, Google says uh, DMX had 15 children. Wow, I don't know how accurate that is, but yeah. that's insane. I w- I wouldn't put it past me. Well, like that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of like we talked about earlier just like with east coast and west coast rap like i also just and like we mentioned with biggie earlier just in general i never really got into a lot of classic hip-hop like biggie or tupac kendrick was the one that got me into it and i pretty much just only really listened to things from then on i never really went back yeah i mean i guess it's also like a regional thing like uh also like chicago rap is way different from like you know, West Coast and East Coast, it kind of has its own sound. I mean, like, Nas is a good example of that. Oh, yeah. I did like Illmatic as, like, a, a more classic album. I think mm-hmm. that was, like, 90s. Who who uh, who wrote that again? Nas, oh, I'm pretty Nas, sure. Nas, there we go. Okay. Yeah. I'm dumb. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Just, like, the, the soundscapes of the subways and the traffic in the city. It just, like, it very much sounded like you were in a city in the winter. Okay, I had to like listen to that album again because the uh the one that I remember listening to the most is uh Oh, it's got Oh, it's now I remember of, New York State of Mind. That was like the big single from it. I think it was like him with like a brown cap or whatever. Yeah, I think so. Oh, yes, it was written. And it was like a trilogy too. Yeah, Still like Matic. Yes, yeah, it was the, that album. Like the first one. Yeah, I think it's like a, he's got like a trilogy of it too or maybe or maybe it's just the two there where it's like the child and then he grows up. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Stillmatic. <laughs> yeah, that's I, I heard it wrong. I was I heard Illmatic, not Stillmatic. But um but yeah, that's the one I listened to. I, I like that album personally, but also like on on the topic of like uh I guess styles, like Chicago definitely has its own style. I mean Lupe Fiasco is one that kind of oh, like, is a good from rep- Chicago. He is from Chicago. Remember they used to say Chi Town? Yeah. Yeah. I guess rap that comes from Texas for me. I don't listen to hip hop too much, but I never hear anyone from Texas like still being kind of relevant. Like uh, I don't even know any rap from Texas. Like uh, all I remember is like it was like huge wave of like you know Paul Wall, Mike Jones, and then Slim Thug, and like um, they kind of like stuck around for like a hot minute, but they didn't like stay relevant as far as you know like yeah I don't even today's recognize rap. all those yeah my 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 already little to no cred with hip hop is uh. It's pretty limited. It's really just like lots of individual artists I really yeah. like. It's not re- like a, I don't really follow it as a whole. Yeah. On to the next epic. Uh, Lil Nas. <laughs> oh, yeah. His little controversy with his uh, Montero song. Uh, I didn't care for it, to be honest. It didn't uh, like the song? It's not that I didn't like the song. Well, yeah, I didn't really care for the song. Yeah. It's it just kind of, it's just two chord progressions, like two little... St- chord changes and but like i don't know the name of like the chord that it like goes into but it just 
doesn't resolve in my ears it just stays very still and like the chord that it hits i I wish i wish i could like tell you the name on it on it but like can't really name it on top of my head but um when he changes to that uh to the second chord it doesn't go anywhere and like i feel the tension of that chord wanting to resolve but it just doesn't happen and it kind of like frustrated me while listening to the song and like it is very like spanish style Mm -hmm. like guitar playing like as far as like choice in chords it to me it's just kind of like just controversy for the sake of being controversy i think a lot a lot of its popularity has to do with the music video Mm -hmm. of course but like i didn't really care for the song too much yeah i thought it was fine um mostly i just got out of a kick of uh i saw some posts in the metal community of people just being like ah i remember the days when uh when metal when we were the ones using provocative imagery and pissing (laughs) off the (laughs) the christians (laughs) there was a meme that i saw speaking of that uh where it was the teenage mutant ninja turtles when they were kids and then had like master splinter as you know holding their hands and like the meme was Lil nas x was master splinter and they would have like dc behemoth uh marduk and like a third band as like the teenage mutant Ninja oh Turtles, yeah yeah <laughs> which i thought was kind of funny yeah yeah i mean didn't really care for that song too much but uh been really getting into bruno mars oh yeah absolutely i think we brought that up a little one at the last time yeah his new collab with anderson pack silk sonic yeah oh uh, that i'm excited for the entire album same and see what they do with that they're really bringing back like the love song era yeah like 70s i don't even want to say it's 70s i want to say maybe like it might be 70s like there there has been some nostalgia going on i i i most of the pop i listen to um uh is like from sarah she's real in the 90s and the current pop hits and yeah there is sort of like a there's like some artists like dua lipa who are kind of like bringing back like a disco thing yeah um emo is coming back like it's sort of like pop punk and emo i've heard Mm -hmm. some trends like that um what is it machine gun kelly has that new album i actually don't care for him but like i'll I'll check it out yeah no i i haven't listened to it myself it's just like i i just know of like sort of some 90s and 80s and maybe even 70s things are sort of coming back Mm -hmm. or i guess things are always called back too Mm -hmm. yeah like style style wise too as far as like the clothing trends like Especially if you go in DC, you definitely see like the mom and dad jeans like still making trend, making headways, you know. That's funny. Like that's the one thing I noticed. Like I, I got to the point where I just cuff up my <laughs> Yeah. The ends of ends of my jeans and I'm just like, this is stylish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back with it, yo. Yeah. So our uh some other the next concerts to cover. The last one we did was Summer Slaughter twenty fifteen and I was looking at my if I had mentioned it before, by the way, I'm like a freak about lists and organization. So I have I have a whole list of every concert I've been to, and it's was, nuts. You should see it. And uh, apparently, we had a pretty awesome end to 2015, where in the span of a couple weeks, we went to three shows. Oh yeah. And I don't. I, my memory's pretty hazy for these, so I don't know if I can do like full bona fide reviews of each individual one but if we talk about them as a whole i think i can probably Mm -hmm. come up with some stuff but yeah as long as you know the look are they all at the film or or is it like they're all at soundstage cool all at soundstage yeah Um, so we can review that area first we've already reviewed it yeah yeah i think at this point we've touched on the mate we we've definitely talked about fillmore we talked about ram's head yeah i i'm sure we've got to have talking about soundstage um so it's probably some of the like dc and new york we haven't like kind of ventured in those but we'll get into Mm -hmm. those later yeah the first was the return of the faceless oh yeah mid november 2015 and that was with after the burial rings of saturn and tooth grinder i'd remember that that show actually that was at soundstage and like uh dude i don't know what happened to tooth grinder like i really loved them like their first two albums pretty sick but then like after that third album came out they to me they fell off and I think it just might be like they want to make money. And to me, that's probably what it is. I was really excited for them at first. That first EP they had 
Schizophrenic Jubilee. Yeah. I think it's called. I was so excited for that because it really gave me some Dillinger vibes. Yeah. It just had a very chaotic energy to it. And I was just so, I was like, yes, here we go. You know, carry the torch, be the mm-hmm. next thing. And then I just, I just did not vibe with any albums they've released since then Mm -hmm. um and then same goes for like seeing them live seeing them live i'm like this just does not carry the same manic energy that that first ep had dude like that uh the sound live i did not like the mix at all it was very uh muddy very muddy very very treble like super on the high end some like some riffs was killer like and i think they're from new jersey so i think that's where you get into dylan oh that's right yeah i guess new jersey is just a chaotic place in general yeah, I th- I, yeah, that that's where they Dillinger started, I guess, because Ben's from there, probably. Yeah, little Greg, farm Greg boy. was from Baltimore. 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 And then, like, of course, I think they just rotated like um, basses and like second guitarists yeah. as the years went on. You yeah, know? and then eventually they stuck with Billy Reimer on drums and mm-hmm. Liam Wilson, I think, on bass. Yeah, he's a Berkeley kid, I think. Right? I'm not sure. I think he's that'd be cool. I mean, uh. And then he Pull went on. Out, Jamie. <laughs> and then he went on, uh, and he's with John Frum now. Oh yeah, that's right. They had that different Dimitri Minakakis as the Minakakis. I would say Minakakis. Minakakis. Oh yeah, Chris Penne on drums. Adam Dahl, that's his name. Oh. Ah. Yeah, because Greg Pucciato, or Pucciato, how do you say his name? Uh, I think Pucciato. Pucciato, yeah. It, it's Italian, so. I think it's Italian. I think for the longest time I said Pucciato, mm-hmm. and then I think some interview I finally heard him say Pucciato. Interesting. Did he say it with like Pucciato? No, not like that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. It is Liam Wilson. That name just changed. Okay. Up oh, Adam Dahl was another, one of the old guitarists, but it is Liam Wilson. Wow. Yeah, I completely forgot about the actor. Yeah, not Liam Wilson, the actor. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure he went to music school though. Cause I I could have sworn he like talked about it or just like. Someone just knew that he went uh, to school or whatever. Anyways, I'm done. Um, Attention span is gone. No, it's cool. But yeah, we were just talking about Tooth Grinders, Muddy, live mixing, or EQ or whatever. Yeah. And just diminished results from that first EP. Yeah. It, like I was really hoping for them to go to like a more chaotic direction because like, what I also really liked about it is that it was thrashy. Yeah. That's what I really liked about them. And then like... um. It was thrashy with a hint of like modern quote unquote gent at the time. And I really liked like the guy's vocals or whatever and like the the riffing. And they had some elements of like some prog too. Yeah. But unfortunately it just I it never like stuck with me with like their current direction. Hopefully they'll like have like a banger or two that I might like in their future albums if they're still a band, you know? Yeah. After that was Rings of Saturn, Sick. which is always fun live. I'm trying to remember 2015 what was going on i feel like was that in the midst of like i I don't know some of the controversy of like wasn't it like the there was something going on like a bunch of band members left or something yeah so um basically what happened was yeah lucas man i think he was just a dick personally (laughs) like uh i experienced this dickness (laughs) quote unquote creative differences yeah so I think a lot of it has to do with, like, um, apparently he wouldn't practice his parts and be very sloppy live. So, like, that was kind of, like, like something that kind of killed the momentum for some of them. But, like, um, I think eventually they got their old guitar, like, one of the old guitars back, like, um, Joel Omas. Like, I think he's super sick. What was that latest album? Ultra Mono or something? Ulta Ulta or something like that. Ulta Ulta or something. It's a good album. I liked it. Yeah. Old to Ula. Yeah. What year did that come out? I think that was last year. Really? No, wow, no, no. Oh, no, 2017. 17. Okay. That's not the latest okay, one. So Jadem. We... Jadem is the newest one. Oh, okay. Or Get Him. Oh, I don't think I've listened to that. Yeah, that was that was three years. Wow, I thought it was last That's year. That's insane. That's three years ago. Wow. I have not listened to that. Two years ago. Two years ago. Getting my math wrong. Did you like it? Oh, yeah. I liked it. I thought it was really cool. But to me, what's always going to be a Rings of Saturn like f- favorite for me is um, Dinger. Dinger, yeah, yeah. Dinger and Lugaki and Lugaki. Oh yeah, yeah. One. I like that one too. Is that one really twenty twenty? 
No, I think that's a remastered one. Oh, that's okay. A, that's the instrumental version. Oh, I see. Yeah, there's Embryonic Anomaly. Oh, wow. I didn't realize they had remastered. Yeah. Jeez. I listened to the remastered of the or Embryonic Anomaly. That, that one's fun, too. That one's just a fun song. That was a fun album to listen to. But uh, I think what really took it off for them was uh, Lou Galkian. But personal favorite was Dinger. Like To me, that thing was like the epitome of um, Rings of Saturn. But like the really I love cool- that I love that song Utopia. It's, oh, yeah. I mean it's such a it's such a sweet nice song. It, it sounds it's not like a heavy the song, but it's yeah it's just so comforting. It is. I agree with that. And uh, to be more objective to Harvest it was like one of my favorite songs. Like the very first track on the album and Gal- Galactic Cleansing. There was I think Dingear the song itself. I'm pretty sure there was some breakdown at the end of it that I was obsessed with for the longest time. Yeah, right and then down. faces imploding. That's a fun one. Yeah, yeah. I think like I think all their f- songs were fun, but like I think like the first two tracks on that album really just hit home for me. Man, now I want to re-listen to them. Yeah, I'm probably gonna. I kind of want to listen to it after you leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can we like wrap this up? Like, yeah, like <laughs> I, to, I gotta listen to this. But uh, uh, yeah, Dinger is a really good album. I really enjoyed it. But yeah, them 2015 live. I feel like there was something going on in this show. Like maybe they were they swapped out some band members or something because something was kind of funky with it live. I I can't quite remember what, but it wasn't like I quite. think the sound like just cut out, cut it out cut out for a bit. Yeah, something about it just wasn't quite up to par. But uh, seeing remembering that show live, uh, Dimitri, uh, the guitarist at the time, uh, he's such a cool guy. Never had a personal experience with it, but like from what I've heard, I say he's like super uh, down to earth dude, super chill, and kind of nerdy too, which I thought was really cool. He kind of added to like his charm. Obviously, a fantastic guitarist if you can keep up with uh, Rings of Saturn, you know. His other uh, project, um, Interloper, that one was really cool. I haven't heard of that. That's a really that's a really cool project that he had going Are on. Are they Deathcore? Yeah, I think like the very first album was like Deathcore, but that if you see ever see it the album with the giant spaceship on it that's really cool it also has like the guitars from um vampire squid which uh, i think vampire squid is also a really cool tech death band you should check out yeah um, yeah if you ever find those no walter sent you yes tell them walter sent you <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna be like who yeah <laughs> who's who's walter oh just a really cool guy off of soundtrack he sent me here but um but yeah uh anyways yeah i thought that was really cool after the burial would have been next on the lineup, which I'm pretty sure I had a great time listening to them. That might have been the first time I saw them live, so I think I was very pumped. Yeah. And 2015, I think that's Wolves Within was just about released. I think. Yeah. Maybe that came out 2013, something like that. But yeah, I was really pumped for it. I was super excited to see them live. I I think what happened to me with After the Burial was for years I wanted to see them. And for whatever reason, things didn't line up right. I didn't get to see them for the longest time. And then all of a sudden, in the span of like a year or two, I just like binge saw them. They just kept coming to the town and I just kept seeing them. Oh, okay, 2013. Okay, yeah. Oh, you so, caught it that fast. Wow. I didn't even. So, yeah, wrap, wrapping that up. And then. Uh, the faceless came on. Oh, dig deep pretty soon. So, yeah. Yeah, three years later. RIP. Dang, yeah. That, I, that was a good album. Yeah, it was. I wonder how long. Was the well obviously it's a three year gap between them, but like I forgot what year did um Justin like died. I don't know, twenty fourteen, maybe. I don't know, but like Dig Deep was a really good album, but also Wolves with Wolves Within was also a really good album, in my opinion. The one that didn't really like stuck with me too well was In Dreams, but I eventually like went back and like listened to it, and I was like, actually, it's not that bad of an album. Yeah. I was just naive as a kid. Yeah, I liked it. I, I think there was I a lot of people, we had mentioned on our previous episode, like a lot of fans didn't like it because it had clean vocals or something. But listening yeah. back to it again, I was like, oh, there's not even clean vocals. There's just like some clean like backup vocals. Yeah. Like harmonizing and stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's not fine. And then I, I didn't listen to the whole album, but I listened to some of Evergreen because like I haven't really – checked out that album too much their latest one and there's like some instances there where they have some clean backup vocals and i'm mm-hmm. like yeah right on like i don't know sounds good i don't have a problem with it i think what's really cool i think as we mentioned this before is like uh after the burial is that type of band where they come like, release the album and you know it's just gonna be banger after banger and then they leave you're yeah. like dude do their breakdowns and you're like yeah and then like leave yeah but you don't get tired of it it's not like it's like fatiguing your ear you know 
at least to me, I feel like they keep it pretty fresh. I agree. And then, uh, like, I know they'll bring the heavy, and I just don't get bored of it. Yeah, I, yeah, I I completely agree with that. I just don't get bored. I mean, of they're it. not like a super. I mean, they've been a favorite band of mine for the years. They're not like a. I don't super like emotionally resonate with it or anything, but like. I don't know when I when I need that itch scratched, I know where to go. Like I don't like hold my heart while I'm like yeah, singing yeah. the lyrics type of thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think I probably don't even know most of the lyrics at all. To no, any of their I songs. know when they grunt. <laughs> yeah. I know when they growl. Like oh yeah, I know like the th- two words before a breakdown or something. Or like the one word like where he does have the breakdown starting it. Yeah, I love it. I don't know. After Bear is a solid band. I I'm happy for them. Like um after listening like to their EP, I think it has a song like Pi Mercury God of Infinity. I thought that EP was really cool. Yeah. And then they remastered like two songs, but I wish they remastered the whole EP. Yeah, I would love the whole thing to be remastered. Yeah. All right, and like the Faceless and the headliner. Yeah. yeah, I like the name of the tour, the Return of the Faceless. It yes. so- sounds like a like a classic horror movie like the return of dracula the return of the faceless and you're just like, Ooh. apparently like their original name was supposed to be the faithless oh uh, okay from what i've heard but like uh i really like the faceless a lot more that makes sense especially with what is it that third album of theirs? yeah yeah that that makes that really lends that name lends itself to that album but why'd they change you know i i don't remember to be honest but like um I guess the faceless just resonated a lot more. It doesn't sound as like, oh, I mean, I am God. I yeah. am, <laughs> I'm an atheist type of thing. But like, like we get it, Michael it's, Keane. It's so wild. But I love you guys. It's so wild. Aquadama was the first Sumerian release. Yeah. That's, Akel- so, that's so weird to think about. I think it's funny how you said Aquadama. I think I always say Akeldama. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it could be like Akeldama. <laughs> I have no idea. It's a really cool. That is like the beginning of like the end of the metalcore era yeah like with that album like that album's so cool and well, then i know you can gush about planetary duality ooh. that album's so cool i know i, I blush a little bit because <laughs> to me that album was notice like, me <laughs> notice me senpai i got to meet him at nam like a few years ago oh that's cool it was really cool talking to him like um just chatting up and then like talking about his signature guitar that he released with vola and like um yeah, just kind of like thank them for like making the music he makes because like I really look up to it, you know. That's awesome. Like, I, I he's a cool guy. At least both both times I've met him at Nam, like super chill, friendly to me. I think he every time I go to Nam is just like I always wear like a faceless shirt because I don't know out of just like it's always there or it's just like notice me, senpai. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, it seems really fun to go to. It is. I I, I thoroughly enjoy it. It's like a like a kid at the candy store type of situation. Yeah, I would like going and just like having so many stilted conversations of being like, yeah, I don't play anything. And then there's just like no, no <laughs> I, it, and it'd be funny to see if like they find that either like they find it really awkward. There's nothing to talk about or they find it very refreshing. And they're like, and they're like, hell yeah, let's talk about something else. I think it's refreshing because <laughs> like they're there to talk about music all the time, like products and stuff like that. That's all. A lot of the artists, that's what they're there, there to talk about. But, like, then you just see some who are just invited. Like, they're just, they're chilling. Yeah. I, I think that, I don't, I like that musical playground type of thing. It's awesome. But, yeah, I think, like, I would give this concert, uh, I think, a solid, like, I think 8.3. Like, I, I was, despite Tooth Grinder kind of, like, bearing the weight of, like, a lot of a loss. But, um... I personally really like the acts after that, like Rings of Saturn, Faceless, After the Burial. Yeah. I personally, that, that's what I would give it. I think I'd give it like a 7.5, and it mostly being a 7, and that po- .5 just attributed it to being the first time I saw After the Burial. Just how high, I, like they were really mm-hmm. what I was there for, and I was so hyped for it. Like, I think I remember one point being like, it's far from the pit like definitely not where the pit was like way on the periphery of the crowd and i was just like going crazy headbanging and stuff i was like completely by my own just looking like a dumbass but just mm-hmm. having so much fun i i i respect your <laughs> <laughs> your answer yeah but uh, it's fun like i don't know like after seeing the faces for, after so long i i literally was kind of like up front like to see michael keen and like hearing his solos and like 
just the whole faceless vibe. And I think like at the time they had um one of the guys from Abigail Williams, like the vocalist, I believe. Also a really cool black metal band if you ever black metal influence. I don't know what they are, to be honest. It sounds familiar. They're awesome. Uh Samus. If you ever check out his YouTube channel, Samus six 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 or whatever. Oh yeah. He did drums when Devin Townsend's empath. Mm-hmm. And then he does drums for Decrepit Birth. Ah, oh, that's right. I love that band. That band's awesome. Do they only have two albums? No, they have three. So, I believe they have three. They have. Yeah, it's Decrepit. like for the longest time they had two, and then I think they like finally re- re- released Axis Monday. Yeah, yeah. So it's oh, okay. Four, four. Four, wow. four albums. So, Diminishing Between Worlds was the album that got me into them. And then Polarity was a uh, follow up shortly after. Excess Monday I wasn't too big on, to be honest, but like Diminishing Between Worlds is awesome. I have a poster of the Axis Mundi artwork, and Sarah really liked it for whatever reason. Nice. Like, out of all my band stuff, for some reason, she really latched onto that. I was like, really? Like, you really like that? The DNA sequence. Yeah, DNA and, like, <laughs> fungi or something. I don't know what that is. They're probably just tripping. Yeah. But, like, yeah, I really like um, Diminishing Between Worlds. It was awesome. It's an album that I heavily listened to as a kid. And then just a couple days later, in early December, same venue at Soundstage, we had Tesseract had a Polaris tour with the Contortionist, Era, Sky Harbor, and Astronaut. Oh, already. To me, that was a prog central. Already. I already know what my answer is. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that concert pretty well, actually. Or wait, did I write, or did I type that wrong? Was it Astronoid? Astronoid. That- Astronoid. Okay, yeah. I don't think I remember them. I don't know if we... I didn't like Astronoid, to be honest. I super don't remember. Sorry, dudes. So I'll say nothing. (laughs) I don't remember. (laughs) But yeah, that was a prog fest. Wow. Skybar. Skybar. Wow. (laughs) Skybar. (laughs) Skybar. That was terrible. (laughs) Yeah, Sky Harbor was decent. Um, That was like... They don't come around to US too often. No, they don't. But yeah, they're decent. Very very melodic and tesseract-esque yeah very clean and melodic and genty right on like they had a a noob uh who also was pretty famous in the maryland i guess like i wouldn't say famous but he's pretty well known amongst the uh, metal community he's a great drummer and also i believe he's also a producer as well uh he's really cool i I really liked his uh drumming style i think he also drummed for intervals for a bit he did. Yes. Yeah. Intervals, Monuments. He he had a couple self-released albums, too, where he did drums, and then mm. he had some, like, MIDI, gent guitar. Um, Usually I, it's the other way around. Yeah, I know. It's so funny. Yeah. I think he... Oh, well, I think he also had, like, some guest people contribute some guitar mm-hmm. um, stuff as well. I think he's... I think he has his own YouTube channel now, and he like plays songs with his wife or something. Yeah, it seems pretty cool. She plays. She's guitar. actually really good at guitar. That's awesome. They covered like the Doom song. Yeah, that's right. The uh, what's Mick Gordon? Yeah, yeah. And Matt Halpern did drums on. Uh, there was like some video game awards. Yeah, and he did drums for some live performance of one of those songs. That was cool. That soundtrack's awesome. The the Doom soundtrack, Doom mm-hmm. and Doom Eternal. It's so genty. To be honest, I actually haven't played any of those games. They're really fun. They're they're obnoxiously metal. The only image of Doom that I had um, growing up was Doom Three, which was when they were into the. Oh, like, it's such uh, a different one. It is such. a I different I still one. like it, but different. It was more of the uh, horror, actual horror aspect of things, versus just uh, running gun. You know. Yeah. Like uh, that was my image of um, Doom. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. The other installments are definitely their own, a different beast. They're just mm-hmm. like a lot. Very fun. Kill. Shoot. Yeah. Reload. <laughs> I, I really should get around to playing those games, but I don't know. We're old now. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old. I'm oh, well, like- I actually remember uh, when I was at college, I didn't, I, I didn't play many video games because when I had free time, I was either sleeping or drinking <laughs> <laughs> classic and, and, and socializing and um so i got out of college and suddenly i was like oh wow i got like time to play games again and doom 
2016 had just came out and I was playing it and I was getting motion sick because it's so what? fast. And I was like, oh my gosh, am I old now? Am I unable to play video games? But eventually I got acclimated and I could play it and I uh, now I'm back to normal. Oh, okay. That's awesome. Yeah, I wish I, I still wish I would like had the uh, energy to play like PC games again. I still do, but I just like choose not to. Yeah. But just like the mental energy. But I know once I start playing, I get hooked. Yeah. I, I debate calling out of work sometimes because I really want to be at that level in Destiny raids. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, anyways, this concert. So Sky Harbor. Yeah, I don't have much else to say. Sky Harbor. Air s- was next. They were sick. I liked Air at the time. They played August stuff from Augment. Yeah, we've talked about them before. They're really good. Their new album is actually really good, too. Yeah, the self titled. Yes. Actually, I kind of want to talk about that a little bit more. Just like, go for it. It's like, Arrow has this like formula you can kind of get after listening to their songs, but that formula doesn't get old because it's always like sick chorus, sick verse, sick melodies, sick chorus, chorus again, and then sick solo. And just like, you just don't get tired of that formula because they just like pump it out and like they've really uh, refined their sound now, you know? And uh, I thought it was really awesome, especially like, opening up with like Snowblood. I thought that that track was tight. I don't really have a refined critique other than just I don't really like it. But I I, I don't really I don't really like the um, the guitarist vocals, like the clean vocals, mm-hmm. like usually they do with choruses and stuff. It's just it's just kind of I don't know too high or nasally for me or something. Interesting. Okay. I, I love the main vocalist, the dude from. Texas in July. Texas in July, yeah. I think he's also from Baltimore, too. Oh, that's sick. Yeah, I like how he can just consistently belt it out and yeah. be really aggressive and yet somehow super discernible with I his lyrics calming. and pronunciation. Yeah. I think he has like a calming aspect to it. I mean, obviously, to someone who like doesn't listen to Era, you just hear just like growl and just like, how's that calming? But it's just like. No, I get it. Yeah, I, I, I personally think it's really calming. It's yeah, su- like you said, it's like super clear when he like yeah. pronounces his words, yeah. which is really difficult to do. I've drifted off to sleep before listening to metal because just like I don't know, at, at some point it all just kind of becomes like a almost like a white noise, like very loud, but it <laughs> sort of becomes like a white noise where it's just constant. Like like there was one time I drifted to sleep listening to Infinite Annihilator because it's just yes. it's it's con it's just constant noise, and so eventually you just kind of like trip out to it <laughs> at least uh, i roll, do eyes roll back you're like oh yeah yeah <laughs> time to sleep <laughs> but yeah that oh yeah infinite Liner, annihilator that's another band where their sound has definitely refined so much yeah From, it, yeah if you had told me they would refine as much as they have i just kind of figured they'd be like a one and done sort of meme band yeah i would love to see them live though the closest thing i got to seeing uh live was this band called Scumfuck. <laughs> which has Dickie Allen. That's right. Yeah. We, we went to, you were there at that Yeah, show, that's right. Um yeah, and I think I, I think Black Tongue. Yeah. They play live, but they're um I think the same members too. Yeah. But they're not Black Tongue's also way more death or um death core oriented. Yeah, it is yeah, it is way more death core. It's a lot more slow and chuggy. Mhm. No, it's like hyper technical. I just I just want Infinite Annihilator. I want to see them again. That would I would be, not again. I want to see them. That would be really fun. Or if not a live show, do like a uh, live stream. Like a yeah, like a live stream. Yeah, I feel like that would just go like clipping central. Like you just hear like clipping in your headphones. You're like, oh. yeah. After Arrow was the contortionist. I'm trying to remember the thing that kind of sucks is like certain bands. I've seen them enough times and at the same venues. I have trouble differentiating like which show is which. So I don't remember if it was this show because it was, you know, in one of the numerous times I saw the contortionist at soundstage, but I'll just tell it now because it's on my mind. I remember there was one time where I had like a almost out of body experience with the contortionist. And it could have been all of like the weed smoke in the air I was inhaling or something, but I just felt so like, at peace and one with the music it was so nice they were, they were playing almost i think they were just playing a lot of back-to-back stuff from language and i just it just that's one of those albums where just like upon first listen i was like oh this is going to be a favorite like yeah. it just it's something that i've just 
as soon as I heard it, I was like, yes, the, the, the sounds they're stringing together is what I've always been craving. <laughs> they, thank you for making it. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, here, here is my money. <laughs> take my money, please. And then I think we got to like take a photo with them afterwards. Yeah, that might have been the one. I think I got a picture with Joey, I think. Robbie, I think. Yeah, I get Joey's him mixed up. Oh, okay, then yeah, it was Robbie. Long hair. Yeah. Yep. Guitarist, Robbie. yeah. Yeah. And then uh got I think I chatted with Mike Lesser for a bit, just saying yeah, just, thank, just thanking right. him. That's right, you did. The contort that when they played that show with Tesseract, oh, I think that was my favorite time that I've ever saw them. Yeah. I, I believe that was my favorite time just because like the crowd was hype, especially like when language two uh conspire came on yeah that was a conspire or just language yeah that's okay. the one yeah the crowd started going off like it was just like pits after pits and then like once like the choruses came ba- came back with like uh the turnaround back into like language one everything got calm again it was just like so awesome so dreamy and i really loved it yeah there's really an ebb and flow to it when they play a set yeah the crowd was really there for it for that show like We've talked about before, a lot of times we see Tesseract, they are... The calmest band there. Open, yeah, they're openers or they're like right before a headliner or something. There's usually like a weird feeling where like the fans aren't... The crowd isn't vibing with it, like they're not there for them or something. Yes. But I mean, this one where they were headlining, people were there for it and it was, it was really fun. They were so oh. groovy and the crowd was bouncing mm. and it erupted towards the end of the set when they played some stuff from one. Like cool. some of the really crushingly heavy early stuff. I, I know what song you're talking about. Acceptance, the concealing the fate part one and part two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that's what they did. Yeah. It was awesome. It was heavy. Heavy as well. Like what I experienced seeing Tesseract that show, I expected at every show. But sadly, yeah. that's not the case. I know what you mean. Yeah. It's not the case at all. God, like seeing them headline at that show with Polaris, like with that album that just came out. Not just came out. I mean, like, at the time when it just came out, it was, the tension was godfully awful. Because, like, uh, if not, do you not remember, uh, they just had, like, the cloud of smoke. Just oh, like, yeah. And, like, uh, you're just waiting for the band to play. But, like, they took forever. I think we were, like, even looking at the time. It was like, it should be time for them to play. They linger and really take a while coming out. Yeah. And then, like, once they came out, we are like, thank God. And then, like, uh, they started playing with, I think, with Polaris, actually, the very first track of that album. And uh, I remember just, like, the crowd was just, like, ruthless, pushing you left and right. And then, like, you guarding my girlfriend. And I'm, like, at some point, I'm, like, fuck it. I'm going in the pit. Yeah. Like, I, I'm into this right Everyone's now. Everyone's moving like a wave just packed together. And I was just, like, I'll see her on the other side, babe. And then, like, uh, just get into pit. And it's just, like, it's so fun, too. I miss the pits, dude. Oh, I know. Yeah, I'm about. I know we're like, hopefully, supposedly on the home stretch here with people getting vaccines and hopefully shows starting back up. But yeah. like, man, yeah, I'm I'm feeling it. I'm ready. Yeah, like uh, Good Year is playing the ninth, uh, the anthem, and I think I might buy a ticket to go see them just because see a COVID concert. Yeah, and plus it'd be kind of cool to be the first concert review during the COVID era. Yeah, this show, I think I really I thoroughly enjoyed it as well. I think I'd also give like an 8.3. Yeah, I think I'd give it an 8. That was a really fun show. Yeah. The crowd being as they were was like such a big selling point to it. Absolutely. Like I they, like I feel like they were re- what really made that show. I mean, uh, obviously the band's performances, but just yeah, people were were ready to have fun. Absolutely. And like the cool thing about that show too is like uh there was never a that guy like some guy being annoying or like too drunk or anything. Like oh yeah, everyone meshed together well. Yeah, I think everyone meshed together well, and I sometimes like cool friendships for, uh, form within shows like that. Yeah, there was no bad vibes in that crowd. I I really fucked with the crowd a lot. I feel like I experienced that a lot at prog shows, and it, I don't. Who knows if it's a thing where you just like, you just mesh in the scene that you most identify with. I think it was like flannels. But yeah, I mean, I I, I I identify mostly as being like a prog head. So I yeah. at prog shows, I feel most at home and vibe with most of the people there. I think that the, the typical prog head style, too, was like flannels, beanie. Definitely. And vans. I thought it was pretty funny. Fantastic show. Loved it. I wish I'd go back. 
and then not, but 10 days later was Between the Buried and Me with their Coma Ecliptic Tour with Enslaved, Internaut, and Native Construct. I don't remember Enslaved, to be honest. I had to look them up, and I kind of remembered them when I looked them up. They were like Viking metal or like power metal or something. I don't know, something mm-hmm. sort of just like powerful Insert melodic courses. And yeah, yeah. Just, <laughs> Insert hand motions. Yeah, just like uh, charge into battle choruses and okay. I don't know, kind of like a hair Nordic looking. Like a Monomarth esque. Interesting. I'm, I'm probably gonna have to look them up right after. I think the only reason I kind of remember them is because it seemed so wholly different to everything else that night. Like Native Construct had just released an album which was doing pretty well, and it was like bona fide prog. Like I think it was like some sort of like like prog opera kind of thing like it was there was like acting skits involved with it like i i don't know there was like some very there was like a strong narrative to it they were def- like the definition of berkeley kids yeah and, and they were really good it was it was a fun performance but yeah you had them and then intronaut intronaut yeah which yeah I, I think we've mentioned some before that we really like that was my first time seeing them and hearing of them and like of course <laughs> first and the second time that i've seen them play that we've both seen them play it was only been three songs oh. only three songs <laughs> like i need a whole headliner yeah and like some drugs involved yeah <laughs> yeah they have a cool sound they sort of not to like always compare something to something else but they they kind of remind me of like say like a mastodon like have like it's a, a, fair. A, a sludgy heaviness but also proggy catchiness if that it, makes sense no absolutely like, there's heavy mas- Mastodon influences. I think they've even toured together at one point. Oh, that'd be a cool one. And that makes sense. Uh, I think they actually also opened up for Tool as well, like in the past. Oh, I could see that. Yeah. It's like Tool Mastodon esque, but like with like jazzier, like, like jazzier, not, I want to say harmonizations, but like um, flourishes. Flourishes and like more rhythmic, uh, playing with more rhythmic aspects of things, especially. Um, at the time, they had Danny Walker, who's a fantastic drummer, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how else to describe it other than like their rhythmic play, and yeah, the things they they do with rhythm are usually what I'm kind of there for with them. Absolutely, everyone in that band is just talented. Sacha, I forget the other dude's name. I re-listened to their latest album. Oh, like uh, some time ago, and it was really good. Uh, existential. F- Existential Inversion. fluid motions, something like that. Inversions, existential fluid oh, inversions. Okay, yeah. And like the opening track is just like, uh, and then like the guy, it says, "Just let it melt on your tongue." It's like, okay, you're in for a trip. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was really cool, but like that band is just so creative. I love them a lot. Like. They're I, fun. It's a perfect album, in my opinion. Like a perfect Intronaut album. And some of their other albums, they kind of also remind me of like a Gojira or The Ocean, where they're a metal band, but there's some something almost organic about their sound. Mm-hmm. Like like so their albums se- seem to kind of have like different, like, I don't know, prehistoric themes or imagery with album covers or something. I just get like a sort of uh, organic or archaeology vibe or something from them okay i thought it was really cool it's like they've been a band for a super long time i actually took a little deep dive like a few years ago to their very first ep like the null and void ep and like some of the stuff that they were doing like early 2000s was way ahead of the curve than what we were like actually listening to as like i guess teenagers at the time and i was like what was this in my entire life because what they were doing was just like way more progressive and like way better thought out than like the metalcore that i was listening to you know at the time that's cool yeah yeah i wasn't aware of that ep i think i've only heard their uh lps mm-hmm. what is the difference anyways i don't get it uh it, like length um like a singles one song yeah i know that ep much. is like two to five there's not really like a hard and fast rule but like i guess eps maybe like two to six songs it's either like amount of songs or I think runtime is actually the bigger thing. Like if it's like 20 minutes or something mm-hmm. or uh, 
or I don't know, maybe if you're like Meshuggah, maybe you have like I, like the one song that's like minutes. 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, and then LP is just long playing record. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the point of the distinction is, just sort of length. I guess like the difference between like a a novella versus a novel, just like mm-hmm. page counts or a poem, short or long. Interesting. Okay, cool. I'll keep that in mind. But yeah, uh, Internaut, that, they should have headlined. Like I, I thought Coma clipped it when it came out. I thought it was cool, but definitely not as cool as Parallax too. Yeah, we've never seen Internaut headline. E- no, even they've that, headlined before, but we've never seen them headline. Yeah, even that last time we saw them, right before COVID went down, they were opening for Cult Mother. Cult of Luna. Cult of Luna, yeah. Cult Mother. I think you're, I c- you're thinking of Wolf Mother. Not Wolf Mother, but like Godmother. A, Godmother, yeah. yes. Godmother is tight. Great yeah. Tuesday night. I, that That'll was be a one fun of my, show. That's a good one. That to was talk one about. of my favorite Tuesday nights of all time. Um, but yeah, yeah, Coma Ecliptic, I wasn't crazy about. I think I was excited for this show because it might have been the first time I saw Between the Buried and Me. Even though I wasn't that hyped about Coma Ecliptic, but they still played. I'm pretty sure they still played like Son of Nothing and some stuff from Colors and older albums. So it was fine. It equaled out. They probably did. I don't remember that. I don't remember them playing shit. Uh, I don't remember the set list that well. The the only the only song I really do like from Coma Ecliptic was whatever that first single they released was Memory Palace maybe don't remember I don't know it just it had a heavy riff and then it got very like Pink Floyd esque and I just liked it I don't know and then like mm. none of the rest of the album I really liked <laughs> <laughs> Coma Ecliptic just didn't set the bar as well for me when uh, I just listened to. Parallax 2, which was yeah. a masterpiece to me. I like, wanted I to like it. it more than I actually did. Like, it yeah. wasn't terrible. It's, if I didn't have the rest of their discography to compare to, I would think it's pretty great prog yeah. metal. But when you, you know, come off a session of listening to, to Colors or The Great Misdirect and then go to that, it's yeah. kind of like, eh, okay. Exactly. And, like, um, I don't I do, I will say, like, um, Coma Clip the coma ecliptic is a little jumpy as far as like how their paul wagner's uh, guitar phrasing is it's just it's sometimes very like goofy not like uh like it's bad but like just because like how he phrased things he's even said it like the way he sounds is just a little goofy and it just kind of sounds really funny not, not like haha funny but i don't know it's weird it's you'd, you'd have to like actually listen to it to kind of understand it's i get what you mean theatrical i guess that's a better word it's very theatrical like a dream theater or something yes. yeah yeah i think of that as like a sort of like a classic proggy sound or like maybe like power metal okay. kind of or at least as i associate it with it mm-hmm. i think i'm ready to rate this one this one to me is like a really strong 7.6 i think we've mentioned before that sound stage is super tight it's a good uh there's some good food places around in fact there's a really cool peruvian chicken place right across the street I really liked. I don't know if it's still there, but like I remember like eating there before shows sometimes. The food's always been good, and like the area is pretty easy to get to as well. They also provide parking upstairs in their garage, and you get a discount if you like ask one of the security guys. I think I'll just give it a seven. Yeah, I I think sevens are probably what I'll, for the most part, just sort of give to most shows. That's just yeah. sort of like the basic like wasn't overly blown away, but had a good time. Actually, we didn't even talk. Actually, hold on, we didn't even talk did about Native Construct. Oh, we, we kind of did. Yeah, we kind of did. I don't even know if they have released anything new or no. not. I, no, okay, just that one album, yeah. Quiet Place. Okay, yeah, they just had that one album. It seemed to be pretty cr- well received mm-hmm. uh, with reviews, but yeah, it was like a like a real nerdy prog fest. It was, and I liked it. It was fun. It was it was better live than. I thought it would be Mm -hmm. like listening to the material like uh, I remember like uh, listening to Native Construct when they were in the huge beginning stages of everything. And I think like I don't know who was the guitarist at the time. Like he was like some Asian kid, but like everything was thumb picked out. He picked everything with his thumb and it was crazy to me. Yeah. I don't know if this that was the same guitarist or was it a different guitarist or whatever. But like um, it was just like two kids in their bedroom play, doing a playthrough and like it's just one kid was just doing everything with his thumb and it sounded really really accurate too that's wild do you know what happened to them 
I, I, I don't know. I think they're just like, all right, cool, it's done. Wow. And I'm sure like that's wild. And I'm sure like since them being like really, really educated in music, I'm sure they got a lot of session gigs. Yeah. And probably did like a lot of fill in. I'm assuming a lot of their um, time is taken up by lessons that they're giving, you know? Yeah. That yeah. And maybe or, or maybe, too, they got a taste of touring and it was just like, ah, it's not for us. Like, yeah. It's not for everyone. It's or, not, not like the easiest lifestyle choice. No. Or maybe they're like, it's a Berkeley requirement. They're like, all right, you got to go on tour at least <laughs> it's once. It's like an internship. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, you got to go on tour, and you're and you're paying it all in your own, out of your own pocket. Oh man, it's one big old project. Did you go on tour? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we were seen. Yeah, I thought it was really cool, but yeah, I think it's actually I might change my answer. When, now that you said like the one thing I was really looking forward to was just Intronaut, so I might give it like a seven point three actually. Yeah, seven point three. Had you seen Between the Bear and Me before? Parallax two. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, that'd be fun. It was actually that you mentioned the first time when we first met. Uh, you pulled up this concert, which was like um, the Safety Fire, uh, Periphery, and I think like um, the Contortionist between a Me for the Parallax Two tour. But I was like, that already happened. It's too late. Oh, <laughs> it's not happening no. again. And I was like, no. I man. was like excited for it. Yeah, I think it was an upcoming thing. Yeah, and I was like, nah, dude, that already happened. Oh my god. Didn't they, for the Parallax 2 tour, didn't they play it in its full in entirety. entirety? In its entirety, which is another thing that I liked about like that tour specifically because they played it from front to back. That's wild. And they ended with White Walls from Colors. That's crazy. Which I thought was really tight. Because that's a long album. It is. And then just having like that weird little uh, reprieve with Bloom. <laughs> oh, dude, they played that part too. Like yeah. They just like did the qu- it's, strum the chords. It's so weirdly heavy still. Yeah, I I loved it. That uh, that to me was one of my favorite between the bear and me shows. That would be super cool. I'm hoping to see them do the great misdirect in its entirety. I'm trying to uh, tell my friend, like, hey, get me tickets to that, please. Yeah, I really want to see that back to back show. Yeah, I haven't I haven't shopped for uh, concert tickets in so long. I'll have to look into it before it sells out. Yeah, because that's going to be in high demand. Absolutely. Actually, since I'm going to a, a comedy show, like I'm seeing Bill Burr, and I can't, I'm actually really interested to see how that's gonna play out. Like, I'm gonna bring my vaccination card just in case they're like, "Hey, we need proof that you've been vaccinated." It's like, well, yeah, I got it right here. Like, I don't know how. I mean, I guess I can come back with some results in like September. Like, hey, so this is how the screening process went. If they even provide it, I mean, it's in Jersey, so I, I can't really say. Do be like, hey, get in here, or hey, get out of here. I need to see that card. Yeah, yeah, I definitely want to go to some more comedy stuff once things open up again like i was telling you earlier like like maybe not even large big name comedians but just the experience of grungy open mic nights yeah it's just local people just get up there you don't know what you're going to get it could be hilarious or it could be super cringy and awkward (laughs) and that's uh, the ride you're looking for yeah yeah i don't know just never never really had that experience before and just throughout the pandemic i've just kind of more so realize the importance of comedy and comedians listening to their podcasts and keeping up with them and just uh, hearing them talking about missing that live experience. It really is a different, like when you play shows live, it is a different experience versus seeing them. Like you need both of those aspects to kind of enjoy it. Like playing shows, like I thoroughly enjoyed it. There's this rush that I get that was like, yeah, I bet. Yeah. It's fun. And then of course seeing the show, is another aspect to you because you're like you're seeing some people you really like or you probably don't even know and then you might discover some really cool music some uh fun yeah that, that's the thing that's tough too like when we do our recent listens at the start of this I, I have such a harder time than i normally would if we were actively going to concerts because it made me realize and it sounds obvious to say but that's where i discovered so many new bands either like actively talking to someone and they refer something to me they're like oh you should check this out or just eavesdropping hearing someone talk about just being around like passionate music fans and just them Mm -hmm. tossing all this stuff the wall it just made me realize like that's how i got so much exposure and i'd go down these deep rabbit holes and find all this stuff and i just throughout the pandemic i just haven't done that as much yeah i mean it makes sense like that was a big chunk of our lifestyle 
Yeah, because because now I've just been more so sticking to like old favorites and just re-listening to stuff or or d- rediscovering old favorites, which has its own merits and is fun, too. Yeah, that's, but, that's super fun. But yeah, I do kind of miss like going down 3 a.m. Internet band camp rabbit holes <laughs> yeah. and discovering like super niche things. Oh, oh, once concerts start back up, I'm going to put this out there. Um once like show starts happening, uh, we have like a little record. I think I think you have like a little recording device that you put in the car that we're just probably gonna talk about as soon as we get off the uh venue. Yeah, so you're gonna hear car noises and like me yelling at <laughs> and DC traffic. traffic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've got like a little handheld zoom mic, which the quality is actually really good on it. But yeah, yeah, we'll do some like uh fresh from our mind yeah right after it post concert reviews because that that was the original intent of this podcast like yeah yeah we we were just about to start doing it and then COVID yeah. happened so we were like well we have a huge backlog of concerts we can refer to but like once COVID shows starts happening but yeah we actually wanted it to be more of like a up-to-date immediate kind yeah. of reviews and uh hopefully I guess after this we'll start, actually start releasing them now yeah our podcast yeah so, we'll start releasing monthly yeah so i'm actually i'm all good now what about you yeah i'm tapped too cool anyways thank you for listening i'm walter i'm brent this was soundcheck good night peace <laughs>